In the second dissection, we're going to dissect the muscles of the back and expose the vertebral column to see the joints that those muscles move. And then we're going to open the vertebral column to expose the spinal cord, which is protected within. Um, as you first start your dissection of the back, you will clean up any subcutaneous tissue. And the first muscles that you see really are not uh, true back muscles, but are called extrinsic back muscles. Because although they're located within the back, they're going to exit the back and move the upper limb. Some examples of those muscles would be a large muscle in the upper back called the trapezius. And if you reflect the trapezius muscle, you will find additional limb muscles deep to it, including the rhomboids and the levator scapulae muscle. Okay. All of these muscles will be reflected to see the true back muscles that move the vertebral column. Lower in the back, we've got, again, a very large muscle that moves the upper limb called the latissimus dorsi muscle. And again, you will reflect these muscles on each side to really get to the muscles that we're interested for this current dissection. Just to give you a better idea of how we reflected these superficial muscles, you simply need to take your scalpel and make an incision along either side of the midline uh, that is the primary attachment of all these extrinsic back muscles. And by doing that and getting your hand deep to the muscle within a plane of some loose connective tissue, you'll be able to separate that muscle from the deeper ones and then simply uh, reflect it back and out of your way. Okay, again, we're going to reflect the extrinsic back muscles so that we can get to the intrinsic back muscles, which are responsible for moving the vertebral column. Now, there are several groups of intrinsic back muscles, and they've got very complicated attachments, but we're going to simplify it. Um, if you first look at the muscle group in the lower back, you're going to see that there's a huge mass of muscle running vertically along either side of the column. This is called the erector spiny group of muscles. And you may read about different subdivisions to this group. We're not going to get into that detail, but simply talk about the erector spiny group that forms a large mass on e either side of the vertebral column. Okay. And again, by just taking a scalpel and cutting down on either side of the spinous processes of the vertebrae, and then using a chisel to scrape that muscle away from its other attachments, you will be able to reflect that entire group of muscles to expose the vertebral column itself. Okay, so this is the erector spiny group of muscles that's particularly well developed low in the back. Okay. If we now go up to the cervical region or the neck region, you'll find some additional intrinsic back muscles. The most superficial group at this level would be a muscle called the splenius capitis muscle. And if you take a look at the orientation of the muscle fibers here, you'll see that they essentially form a V on the back of the neck. So those ang the fibers are angling from the midline upward and laterally as they approach and attach to the skull. Okay. Again, by cutting along the midline, the attachment of the splenius muscle, you can find a deeper group of muscles. Okay. Now again, if you take a look at the orientation of the muscle fibers, you'll see that these are running more vertically along either side of the column. And this muscle is called the semispinalis capitis. All of these extrinsic back muscles are going to be responsible for uh, extending the spine and also for rotational movements of the spine. Now, as an orientation to what you're going to be doing in the next step of the dissection, we've got an articulated vertebral column here, just so you can appreciate some of these surface landmarks that you see on the cadaver. Now, these bony processes that are extending out posteriorly are the spinous processes right on the midline. Uh, those are for muscular attachment. And then if you look closely uh, at these vertebrae, you also see additional processes, the transverse processes, uh, again, serving as muscular attachment points. Now, you might need to look a bit more closely to see that there are joints between the pairs of vertebrae here at each level. So there is a limited amount of movement at each intervertebral joint. This is an isolated vertebra to show you some of the parts that you're going to be removing, cutting through during this next dissection. Uh, this is the body of the vertebra. You're going to find that on most of the vertebrae along the column. And then there are 
um, some portions that form the boundaries of this vertebral canal, the spinal cord being housed and protected within the vertebral canal. Now what you're going to do to expose the spinal cord and its branches is to cut through the bone of the vertebral column and remove it so that you can see inside. Okay. The part of the bone that's attached to the body and extends posteriorly is called the pedicle. And then the portion of the vertebra that forms the roof over this vertebral canal is the lamina. Where the two laminae meet, that's where the spinous process forms. And where the pedicle and lamina meet is where the transverse process forms. Okay. You're also able to see the articular processes that will form joints between the sequential vertebrae. Now one thing to pay particular attention to is the size of the vertebral canal. It's perhaps about a centimeter in diameter, so as you're making your saw cuts through the laminae on the cadaver, you need to be certain not to make those cuts too wide. Okay? For example, if you uh, get a little bit too wide with your cuts, you may only be cutting off the transverse processes and doing nothing to get into the vertebral canal and expose the spinal cord. So I would estimate that about a centimeter wide would be uh, what you're going to uh, cut and remove from the vertebral column to expose the spinal cord. Here are the spinous processes of the vertebrae and your goal is to remove the spinous processes and laminae along the entire length of the vertebral column. So the first step in this process, after you've cleaned away as much of the soft tissue as possible, is to take a saw and score along the entire length of the vertebral column. Okay. just lateral to the spinous processes cutting through the laminae. Okay. And this should ensure that you expose the spinal cord and the surrounding tissues without going too wide. Okay. After you've done that initial saw cut, um, which should be relatively shallow, you want to finish the removal of the laminae by using a chisel and a hammer. Okay, so angle the chisel in medially and then use the hammer to uh, continue going through the bone and ultimately remove the vertebral column piecemeal along the entire length and you will expose the spinal cord and surrounding meninges within. We've completed making the cut through the laminae along the entire length of the vertebral column including down into the sacral region. So you may or may not be able to pull the entire um, portion of tissue off in one piece, but in this case we can. So now we're removing the laminae and the spinous processes of the vertebral column. Now what you see inside is not the spinal cord immediately, but some of the tissue that surrounds the spinal cord, one of the layers of the meninges, the dura mater. Okay. And if we incise that, we can see the other two layers of meninges inside this and see the spinal cord itself. It's very easy once you get into the dura mater to simply slit the entire length of it open with the scissors or even a probe. And now, pulling the edges of the dura mater aside, you can start to see some of the other meninges surrounding the spinal cord. Okay, the next layer that we would encounter is the arachnoid, and that is this very flimsy layer that has collapsed onto the surface of the spinal cord that you can just barely see. It's very delicate, and it is collapsed away from the dura mater uh, because the fluid that normally holds it there is no longer present. By removing that, now you don't see anything distinctive as the innermost layer of the meninges, the pia mater, uh, but that would be attached directly to the surface of the spinal cord itself. As you get into the vertebral column and want to look at the meninges and the spinal cord, it's helpful if you cut away some of the dura mater and reflect it out of the way so you're not constantly having to hold it back and out of your way. As you do get that revealed, again, you'll see the arachnoid, which has collapsed on the spinal cord, and we have dissected some of that away. But one thing that's striking as you look at the spinal cord itself is that it's significantly shorter than the vertebral column itself. In fact, it ends approximately at vertebral level L2, so that as we look at the spinal cord here, it becomes narrower and narrower at its inferior end, 
forming structure called the conus medullaris, this inferior cone-shaped structure. Extending directly off the conus medullaris, you're going to find a strand of tissue called the phylum terminale. That is a specialization of the pia mater, which anchors the spinal cord to the coccyx and runs inferiorly within the vertebral column to do so. Some of the other structures that you see mingling with the phylum terminale here are collectively called the cauda equina, and they are dorsal and ventral nerve rootlets that will form spinal nerves forming at sequential vertebral levels and exiting the vertebral column so that the entire body receives innervation. Now if we go back up uh, to slightly more cranial levels, we can see how each spinal nerve is constructed. Now zooming in here at the spinal cord itself, we can see these strands branching from it. Okay. Now of course we're looking from the posterior or dorsal side, so what you see first are the dorsal rami. Those would be sensory nerves or contain sensory information going back to the spinal cord. And you can also get a glimpse of the ventral rami, which branch from the ventral or anterior side of the spinal cord carrying motor information. Now at this particular level, we've got a very nice example of another specialization of the pia mater called a denticulate ligament. This also helps to anchor the spinal cord and hold it in position. And the denticulate ligaments come off the lateral edge of the spinal cord, run right through this space, and anchor the spinal cord to the dura mater. It's nice to use those as a landmark because you're going to find them separating the dorsal rootlets, the sensory rootlets, from the vent ventral rootlets or the motor rootlets. Now let's follow those dorsal and ventral rootlets away from the spinal cord and ultimately they will come together to form a spinal nerve from this level. Okay. Following them away from the spinal cord, as you get to the position of the intervertebral foramen, there's a swelling here which represents the dorsal root ganglion and that is where the sensory nerve cell bodies are found uh, for those axons that are traveling within the dorsal root. Now following away even further, you're going to find the major branches of the spinal nerve. The spinal nerve itself, where all the motor and sensory fibers are together, is very short. It's about right here, maybe a couple millimeters long. And immediately what you're going to find is that spinal nerve branches into a dorsal ramus, which is quite small because it only innervates the deep back muscles or the true back muscles and provides cutaneous innervation uh, as the posterior cutaneous nerve. The ventral ramus is much larger because it's got a much greater territory to supply. This is the nerve that wraps all the way around the body wall, uh, gives off the lateral cutaneous nerve that you saw in the last dissection and also the anterior cutaneous nerve that you saw in the previous dissection. The other structure that we can find here is a nerve that you see heading straight anteriorly. Now we can't really see what it connects to, but just keep in mind for now the position of this branch and the fact that it's called a communicating ramus, which will link this spinal nerve to the sympathetic trunk, part of the autonomic nervous system. We've used a scalpel to cut a small section through the upper thoracic level of the spinal cord and you can see the small size of it relative to a dime. Pretty amazing what your spinal cord does for you for its size. And the structure that you see in the spinal cord is actually pretty limited. You can see the distinction between the gray matter and the white matter. Um, confusingly, the gray matter is central and it looks lighter in the embalmed specimen and the white matter, which is around the perimeter, has a darker appearance to it.